what is the 30 30 30 study that you're planning and and then perhaps we can you know jump in and talk to the specific elements of this framework that as we just mentioned uh, are kind of aimed at reducing that hunger gap and I, I guess essentially making it easier for people to lose weight and keep well, it off. Well, and kind of going back to the implementation part of it. So as we've mentioned several times now, um, lifestyle change is difficult and some people do really well for a little bit, but then wane at their motivation or life happens or whatever. So trying to come up with something that is simple for them to follow, um, definitely based on evidence that we have from studies that show we can help people with satiety um, through what they're choosing to eat. Obviously, lots of evidence about the benefits of exercise, some of what we've talked about already today. So it's really looking at a program that was Kevin's idea, and he can share his other acronym that he shares, but uh, I can never remember. But 30, 30, 30 is way easier. So 30 uh, grams of protein per meal, 30 grams of fiber per day, and 30 minutes of exercise per day is our 30, 30, 30. I love that you chose three things that I think are the least controversial <laughs> of, I mean, there's still controversy probably in certain I'm sure there extreme is. ends of the <laughs> nutrition world, maybe in the fiber fiber element, there's carnival saying you, you don't need any fiber and there's probably some people that are staunchly opposed to protein, but yes. generally most people would agree getting enough protein in the diet and enough fiber and exercise are three, three kind of good first steps. Yes. And, and the idea is to deal with both sides of the energy balance equation. And so we've got pretty good evidence that higher protein in a meal will produce satiation and then satiety lasts a longer period of time. So you, you feel full longer. Can we just quickly <clears throat> define satiety, satiation, and hunger, because I know we're throwing those around. Right. And, and these are slightly, they're related, but different concepts. So satiety is sort of a feeling of fullness. You, you've eaten enough. So satiation is the process of moving from, you know, wanting to eat to feeling full. Satiety is sort of how long that lasts. Hunger is that you have a physiological drive to eat. I you know, want food now. So when we do studies to look at appetite, we ask four questions. We ask, how full do you feel? How hungry do you feel? What is your desire to eat? And then if you were to eat now, how much do you think you would eat? Prospective consumption. And these are related concepts, but, uh, you know, people who really specialize in this area will tell you that they're, they're not identical. And you can have situations where you have desire to eat, but you're not really hungry. Um, you can have other situations where you have a feeling of fullness um, uh, and it's not connected exactly to hunger or uh, desire to eat. So, you know, they are related, but most people understand, you know, kind of the physiological sensation of hunger. And most people also understand that desire to eat is not always connected to hunger. So the old, you know, uh, example of that is, you know, there's always room for pie, you know. Yeah, it happens to me every night. Yeah. If I'm, if I'm on the couch watching Netflix, <laughs> right. I've eaten enough food, I'm not hungry. But for whatever reason, I'll go to the kitchen and grab it, something else to eat. Exactly. And, uh, you know, after 4 p.m., average American consumes more than 50% of their calories after 4 p.m. So they tend to graze through the evening. So it's not because they're ravenously hungry after 4 p.m. It's because they're lonely, bored. They Watching TV. You're watching TV and something to do with your hands. Right, exactly. So, and it becomes a habit, a routine. Yeah, a routine. Um, so with protein... There's an interesting uh, relationship of protein to hunger and fullness. And what we've found, and not everybody agrees with this, so I have to say that you know, very well-known people in the field you know, say, no, you're mm. full of it. I just wrote down Barbara Rolls. Name. Yep. So, so we'll come back. So actually, uh, this is going to be very much related to the fiber component especially. But with protein, um, what we found is that if you add 
protein in exchange for carbohydrate in a meal, you will get more satiation and greater satiety, less hunger. Is that any type of carbohydrate or refined carb? Uh, it, it seems to be any kind of carbohydrate, but um, it's tied into the fiber component, so it's a little bit complicated. But for the most part, the studies are generally replacing uh, refined carbohydrate starches and sugars with protein. And what we found is that under 20 grams in a meal doesn't move the needle at all. When you get beyond 20 grams, you start to see this satiating effect. And when you get beyond 30 grams, it's always there. And it doesn't really seem to be related to the person's body weight. I would have expected that maybe a person who's 240 pounds would require 40 grams of protein, whereas somebody who's 120 pounds maybe re requires only 15 grams of protein. But that's not what we've seen. We've seen that we always see the effect when we get to 30 grams of protein or so more. So there's some type of nutrient sensing that's independent of your body weight. Yes. So that, that seems to be the case, at least based on the studies that, that we've done. So when you replace carbohydrate with protein, you get more satiety. And uh, so that's part of the story. And the question is why? Well, Arnie Astrup um, and colleagues uh, in Scandinavia, they have uh, done studies on this and they show this dose response effect. When you increase protein as an exchange for carbohydrate, you get a higher GLP-1 response. And then there's an interesting thing, which is that the L cells in the small intestine are not evenly distributed. And so you have more of them later on in the small intestine. And so if you can delay protein digestion until later in the small intestine, that seems to help increase that GLP-1 response. Now, GLP-1 is complicated because we know with GLP-1 receptor agonists, you're talking about supraphysiologic levels. But then there's a class of drugs called the DPP-4 inhibitors, and they basically just slow down the breakdown of GLP-1. Is that acarbose or is that? Separate? No, acarbose is an alpha-glucosidase gotcha. inhibitor. Yeah. Um, we can talk about that in a minute. Yeah, um, let's come back to that because now that you're talking about protein so, getting to the end of this, the small intestine, yeah, thinking so, about ways to slow down digestion. Yeah, exactly. So <laughs> GLP-1 is released. Um, these L cells are releasing GLP-1, but GLP-1 has like a two-minute half-life and it's mostly having effects locally. But there's a lot of connection between the gut and the brain. So you release GLP-1, that stimulates the vagus nerve, sends signals up to the brain, and then you actually release GLP-1 in the brain. But of course, that's hard to study in humans, hard to get people to volunteer for you know brain biopsies and such. So, Which uh, presumably then dampens the drive to eat. Right. Dampens the drive to eat. And, and that's what... Arnie Astrup and others have shown um, that you get this uh, larger GLP-1 response. You also have GIP, glucose-dependent uh, insulinotropic polypeptide, also known as gastric inhibitory peptide. And uh, so- I won't ask you to spell that one. Yeah. GLP-1, GIP response go up with more protein. So I think we have you know, reasonable evidence to support that view, even though not everyone agrees with it. And so with more protein in a meal, you get more satiety, but you have to get to 30 grams of protein to consistently see that effect. So you've got to get to 30 grams and then it's improved if you are able to slow down gastric emptying? Yes. So, well, slow down digestion of the protein. And so that's where some of the fiber comes in. So as an example, viscous fibers, like what you get in, you know, viscous fibers that you might take as a laxative. Um, like a psyllium husk right. or something. Psyllium husk. Um, I try not to use, you know, brand names, but I'll say the brand name Metamucil that most people are familiar with. And so that creates a gel in the intestine. And so it slows down digestion because it protects the food from digestive enzymes. It just creates a barrier and they uh, don't digest as quickly. And so it slows down digestion of carbohydrates and proteins. And so then you digest the proteins more slowly, 
you get more protein reaching those um, L cells and a higher GLP-1 response. That's a hypothesis. And then there's another element to it, which is for fat, which stimulates CCK release. CCK is a protein that slows gastric emptying. Um, there's also a hypothesis that when you have viscous fiber in combination with fat, that that is causing the fat to be in contact with the intestinal wall longer and gives you a higher CCK response, which slows gastric emptying. So protein and fiber may be synergistic in terms of helping to control appetite. And then there are other things as well that we can talk about separately, which is they also affect the other side of the energy balance equation, energy expenditure. Yeah, let's make sure we get to that. I think it was on our Zoom call that we did. That was the first time I'd heard anyone talk about this interaction between protein and fiber in the same meal with regards to how it affects appetite. Right. And, and I will say that we need a lot more studies. So these are hypotheses. They're somewhat supported by the studies that we've done, but we need a lot more to be more confident that this is really happening. What does that look like from a, a food point of view perspective? If, if someone's listening and thinking, okay, I, I've got a good idea what 30 grams of protein looks like. Um, and then the 30 grams of fiber, I'm presuming, is not per meal. That's across a day. That's across a day. Let's make that clear. Yeah. I was like, I thought I said day. Yeah, but definitely there's, a day. There's, <laughs> there's, uh, you mentioned there, you know, there's viscous fiber. Fiber is an umbrella term, although sometimes it, it could be confused for a single thing. There's lots of different types of fiber, right. viscous, non-viscous, fermentable, non-fermentable. Um, is, is the simple guide of just getting 30 grams from a variety of plants, is that enough to sort of satisfy the body's requirement for viscous fiber and these different types or does the individual need to be a little more specific and perhaps including certain foods that would take the simplicity away simon it would <laughs> so we're it trying would, to make it would this. be the next step underneath the the right, 30, 30, right, 30 right, right. framework and, and, and honestly you know like 30, 42, 30, that, that's just, you know, people don't have our time with that. So 30, 30, 30 is a right. simplification. We like to make it as simple as is practical. Right. And the, I should also say for each of these, it's at least, at mm -hmm. least 30 grams of protein per meal, at least 30 grams of fiber per day, at least 30 minutes of exercise per day. But you're right. The, the protein part, I think people, it will be fairly simple, although I think some people would struggle as well. So giving them options in terms of a protein supplement or something like that. But I think with fiber, you know, just getting people to consume higher fiber foods is going to be important. And we're considering maybe we do consider a fiber supplement to get them to the 30 gram minimum. Um, and, and in particular, I mean, there are you know, several foods like oats and barley, for instance, that have viscous fiber. But, you know, to get the amounts of fiber that we're talking about is a bit of a challenge. It can certainly be done with food alone. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think uh, supplementation with something like Metamucil, as an example, might be helpful mm -hmm. as well, um, just to make it more practical to do. Mm -hmm.